we're in this series, and it closes tonight. Um, we've been in this series called Field, and we've been using this example of soda and Jesus, right? Uh, so soda represents our friends, those people in our lives that really pour into us, and we've been this cup. They pour into us, and so our beliefs and our behaviors are stemming from those influences. And some of it's good, all right? Hey, can't even lie to you. Some of it's good. Uh, but with some of that good, we've noticed that there are some bad characteristics that come too um, that we kind of need to filter out. Uh, and then we have some of those uh, that have relationships with Jesus, and we said that's Gatorade or Powerade, right? They're a little bit healthier for you, help replenish some stuff in you. Like when you're down, you tend to want to call that friend that has a relationship with Jesus. Like, hey, do you have some motivational for me? And they send you a clip of some pastor saying something. You're like, dang, I feel better. Like you need those friends, and we said they help with it. And then we, of course, said that Jesus is the water, the agua. So tonight's water is brought to you by Le Bleu, all right? Uh, that way, from my Pentecostals who speak in tongues, boom, there you go, different language. Um, but that is what this represents right here. So Jesus is the water, and so tonight, we're going to focus on what happens. Uh, what's typically the response that I should expect? If, if, I'm, if I'm coming to squad, Josh, and I implement what you talk about, and I feel God pulling me to do some things, and I go to share with a friend about Jesus, what can I expect to happen? And what's really cool is that Jesus gave the answer. He essentially said there are four ways that people respond. So they were going to respond one of four ways, okay? So that's where we're heading in Mark chapter 4. If you want to turn in your Bibles, we'll be there in a minute. But let me set this up with some questions to help you take some notes and understand why we're talking about this, and your group discussion should have helped. But the title of tonight's message is, How Do You Respond? How do you respond? And I want to just talk about any kind of thing, any response. How do you typically respond? So, for example, um, if you're an athlete, how do you respond to coaching? When your coach says, hey, do this, do this, do this, and it'll be effective for you, how do you tend to respond? Is it, man, I ain't doing all that. That's too much. You're asking too much, coach, right? You end up batting cage. Hey, choke up. I ain't choking up. I got enough. I've been in the weight room, right? Is that you? Hey, working on your jump shot. Hey, you got a high release. Okay, nah, coach, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a yank that thing. You, hey, I'm Steph Curry out here. I ain't listening to you. Or is it, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. All right. Okay, so I do. All right, cool. So which is it? Is it like you push back or do you tend to receive? Uh, so that's where we're kind of heading with that, that question. So how do you tend to respond to coaching or instruction? But the one, if we're honest, that's typically... The more resistant is how do you respond to correction? So Linux responds to our correction with tears. <laughs> if we're being honest, it's, it's tears, okay? Uh, and you used to respond with tears. Now you tend to respond to correction differently depending on who you're being corrected by. If it's a person you're dating, it's playful. Oh, <laughs> okay, yeah. Right? If it's a friend, ah, oh, man, oh, whatever, man, it's whatever. No, I, I'm going to do it my way, right? Correction that way. If it's your parent, sometimes if they meet you with anger, you respond back with flowers. I'm just kidding. Yeah, anger. Yeah, it's going to be anger. It's definitely anger. You meet tension with tension, right? Um, so, for example, if you ever feel disrespected, then you will present or produce disrespect. Why? Because you want to get some respect back. So at the end of this message, we're going to help you with the, those two situations. But let's jump into what Jesus taught, and we'll fill in the blanks along the way. So Jesus was asked a question. Uh, he was teaching. He was giving this parable. And at the end of it, his disciples and a group of some other people did not understand what he just taught. And he used a parable. A parable is just an analogy. It's, it's like a simile. Uh, it's when you're teaching something, but you're using like a fictional story to do it. So you can recognize this any time that your parents or your teacher said, oh, it's like, and then they give an example. That's like a parable. So Jesus would teach using parables, these fictional stories that made real life application. And he's asked, so what did you mean by that parable? And he says, essentially, when you present God's word, you'll have one of four responses. So we're going to jump right in Mark chapter 4, verse 13. And here's what Jesus said. Uh, then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And in verse 14, he goes into the first example. He says, the farmer sows the word, okay? So the word 
is your, like your Bible, okay? It's, it's God's Word. You're teaching people about the Word. So this is the seed, okay? So you, you throw out the seed to people, and some people are like seed along the path, like a hard path, right? It's like a road where the Word is sown, right? You, you throw it out there. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the Word that was sown in them. So here's, here's what he's saying. Here's another example. So this is me giving you a parable, an analogy, okay? What Jesus just told them is like this, that you try to tell people about Jesus, and you try to pour into them some Jesus, and in that way it works. It goes in and it sticks. But people who don't want to hear it and don't receive it, it's like you're pouring it into them upside down. Why is it upside down, Josh? Because the devil comes and uses their life experiences to tell them and show them from their perspective, God doesn't love you. God's not real. I've had too much pain in my life to receive God, so it's like you're trying to pour into a cup that has a lid on it, or like it's been flipped upside down. Now, here's why I'm giving the example of the cup being flipped upside down. Because like we talked about last week, why would God allow bad things to happen? If you missed it, go check it out. It's on YouTube. But the flipping of that represents a perspective. Because you can have something bad happen to you, and you can get so angry at God because of it, and you push back against God. Why would you let this happen? And that's understandable. I get that. But you can't just use that to say God doesn't exist and stay angry at God. Here's why. Because the same thing has happened to other people. And it was the reason they received God and accepted God. You had something bad happen to you, and you push against them. The same thing happened to someone else, and they received God because of that situation. So that's why it's just this. The devil will come into your mind and change the perspective of what you've been through. And so now, all of a sudden, anytime someone tries to tell you about Jesus, you push away as though they're pouring it on a cup that has a lid and you don't want to receive it, so nothing sticks. So that, that's the first way that people tend to respond. So if you ever try to tell a friend, they may respond that way. All right, just a little heads up. Uh, the second way is in verse 16. Uh, Jesus said that, well, there are others too, okay? Uh, so others, it's like seeds sown on rocky places. Uh, they hear the word and at once receive it with joy. They are so excited. They are so fired up. They receive it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. So when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, because of Jesus and then following Jesus, they quickly fall away. So it would be like you come to squad and you're so excited. You're this cup now, right? You're a little smaller in your faith, right? And you're so excited and you're so pumped up. The word, like the, the song was just on point and you got so excited about squad, but by the time summer was over, you were ready to hang out with your friends again, and none of them had a relationship with Jesus, or they picked on you for being a Christian, and they asked you all these difficult questions that, to be honest, Josh, the questions made a lot of sense, so none of it stuck. You were excited at one point, but it just kind of all poured out. It was like pouring into an empty cup or a cup that had a hole in it and just emptied itself out. You were excited at first, but then you were met with some, some pushback, you're Let's be honest, guys, the, the girl you're dating, she says she didn't want no Christian man. And you're like, oh, you bet. I don't even know who Jesus is. Shoot, I was talking about Zeus. Hey, let's go do something. Right? That's you. Or, ladies, you realize that he's never been to church, doesn't want anything to do with church. So then you're like, oh, okay, yeah, me neither. Uh, what, what, let's do brunch on Sunday. Yeah, I'm free. So all of a sudden, it's not important to us because we've been met with some resistance. Or someone asks you a difficult question about God or the Bible and you're like, hey, that makes a lot of sense. I don't know if I believe because you didn't have any root or foundation. You didn't have a squad around you of some Gatorade people that could help make sense of that question. That's why we invite you, hey, if you have a question, ask your question. We're not going to argue with you. We just want to talk to you. You may make a really great point. Make it known. Let's talk about it. Let's discuss it so that we don't all become empty at some point. So that's the, that's the second way that some people tend to respond, okay? Uh, the next one, probably my favorite one, the next one is this in verse 18, still others, Jesus said, 
Like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So in other words, Jesus is saying it's like this. Uh, We all have these desires that we want to pursue and these things that make us happy. We've talked about those this series. But it's kind of like we have those desires that make us happy. It's our sports career. It's our grades. It's our job to make money. None of these things are really bad. It's the relationships we're in. And that's our big priority. That's our big cup. And Jesus, well, he's just this little small cup. This thing I do on Wednesdays, I mean, it ain't no big deal. It's it's just a little Wednesday something, a little Sunday morning something. But when you compare it, your priority for Jesus and making him the priority of your life is really small compared to everything else going on in your life. You know, I don't make time to read the Bible. That's just on Wednesday nights. I hear hear the Bible weekly. I don't listen to praise music. I mean, the the two songs on Wednesday is enough for me. J. Cole from DeVille, right? So it's, and nothing wrong with all of J. Cole's stuff, and you get the clean version, but, you know, not nothing wrong with it. It's really cool. It's got a good beat to it, good words some of the time, right? But, but no time for God? So it's just like you, you hear the words like, nah, it's just a different priority. I'm not that interested. And what's really cool, and this is something I didn't share with the middle schoolers, is that there's another parable where Jesus talks about this And he says, well, it's like having weeds among the seed. So the example there is that you'll have some of what you planted. I don't know how many of you like grow things that are legal. But if you grow some things, um, if you're out like like cutting your grass, there's the grass grows and the weeds grow, okay? But the thing is, God, Jesus talks about a time where he's going to let the weeds grow, and the thing that he planted grow at the same time. And he's not going to separate them, because if he did, he might end up taking out some of the stuff he planted. He doesn't want to do that. So he lets it grow together and see kind of which one's going to force out which. And one of the reasons this is my favorite is because that's our everyday life. That you have relationships and friendships where you want God to be important, but to be honest, you haven't seen it modeled as important around you. And our bottom line tonight is that you can only produce what you consume, and it doesn't seem important to anyone else. But going through life trying to identify which one are the weeds and which one's the seed. Because the last time I checked, and in my life growing up, I never had an opportunity that was bad for me show up wearing a shirt that says, I'm a bad decision, don't choose me. Now I call them ex-girlfriends, right? But I don't, I don't see that at the time. I'm just out there pursuing not realizing that I'm actually making God small to make my desires bigger, and, and they don't identify themselves like, hey, I'm a bad choice for you. Choose me. It's not like that. It just seems like something that's a desire at the time and a priority. So I filled this cup and not this one. So for some, Jesus says, they won't be a priority. And then there's the last one. And um, this is a pretty cool one. If As a youth pastor, this should be my favorite, but I, as I said, the last one was. But verse 20, here we go. Others, like seed sown on good soil, it's fertilized, it's soft, it receives the seed. Check this out. On good soil, they hear the word, accept it, but they do something with it. So they hear the word, they they hear it, they accept it, and then they do something with it. They produce with what was given to them. They produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, and some 100 times what was sown. So that would look like this, that you come to squad and you hear a teaching, and you're like, man, that, that rhymed, that sounded good. That's, that's in the Bible, John? That's in the Bible? That was really cool what you did with that water and that soda and that Gatorade. Man, I'm going to have to go tell my friend about that. And then you come back next week. Really? Man, I've had that question for a long time, like, how could a loving God allow bad things to happen? And now I understand. It makes sense. I need to tell my aunt about that one, because she's been going through something for a long time. And then you come back. Now, Josh, I hadn't heard it. So John 3, 16, really? Man, if my mom let me get tattoos, that'd be the one. And you start pouring into other people. But here's the thing. You actually do this all the time. To, to put it back into terms of our, our message right now, you actually produce things for other people all the time. You're helping them 
them, your friends, your family, the people who follow you on social media, you're producing in them what you consume. Because you will produce what you consume. Can I tell you some bad news that you do not want to hear? You're becoming more and more like your parents every day. No, I'm not, Josh. We don't even agree the same. I hear what they're talking about. No, 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 no. You're actually becoming more and more like your parents every day. Here's how I know. Because you will produce what you consume. Well, Josh, we don't even agree. No, no, no. You, you, you may not agree. Here's why. Because you're consuming from your friends and your favorite celebrities as well. So that's where you push against your parents at. But you produce what you consume. Uh, because if I told you, so since we have the le bleu water, I took French in high school. Don't quiz me, please. Uh, but how many of you took French or are taking French right now in school? Awesome, awesome, awesome. So just you and me, all right? So that, that's it. So if I told this group, je m'appelle je sois, you'd be like, um, what? And the reason you cannot produce back to me a response like I gave you is because you have not consumed French. But what I said was, my name is Josh. Now, if I told you, um, je ne sais pas, Josh, I really, we get the example. Well, that would be me saying, I don't know. So my question to you again is, how are you responding? How do you tend to respond? So let me give you a practical example of tonight's lesson. Can I give you a life hack to use on your parents? Anyone ready for this? All right, here's a life hack. If they're in the room, I'm sorry, they, they already know your secret, okay? Uh, maybe you can send them a video to watch for, to distract them for a second. Um, but, but here's what the life hack's going to be, all right? Let's use a real example. Let's pretend, because no one in this room would do this, let's pretend that you got into an argument with your parents. As a parent, I cannot foresee being in an argument with my son. There should be no argument. But let's pretend. Um, you're in an argument with your, your dad, all right? So let's say um, you're in your room. You have your headphones in because it's, it's you and you're, you're you. Uh, so you're in your room, you have your headphones in, you're watching a video, maybe you're FaceTiming, right, talking to about, hey, how's it going? Hey, did you go to squat? Nah, girl, you say you don't want no squat, you don't want no God, I ain't, I ain't trying to miss me all that. All right, all of a sudden you're, you're talking to whoever you're trying to date and then you hear, oh, don't make me take my belt off, right? Didn't you, that might send some people triggered, like, right, you just, oh, oh. But you hear the footsteps coming up the stairs of someone who can only be pops. And then he gets to your door, which is shut, because it's your room, right? And you hear, oh, here we go again. And he comes in, why is this door locked? And you say, because it's my room. Pause. It's actually not technically your room. It's just the area of the house your parents let you stay for free. So just keep that in mind before you try to respond, all right? But, but let's keep going with the example. Because it's my room, Dad. Well, why is it that every time I'm up here in your room, it's a mess? Don't you ever clean up? Well, Dad, if it bothers you that much, why don't you just not come to my room? So if that's too close to home, you might want to record this and write this down. I want to help you out by asking this one question. Why did you respond to your dad the way that you responded to your dad? Well, let's go back through what Jesus taught, because sometimes it doesn't stick. Um, sometimes um, it's short-lived. Uh, sometimes there's other priorities, or you receive it, you hear, right, and you change, you produce with it. Okay, let's go back into the moment. Because it's my room, why don't you just not come to my room, Dad? Why did you respond that way to your dad? Probably because what you consumed from dad was that kind of response. That's right, Josh, so he deserved it. Skirt. No, 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 I didn't say that. I'm just saying the, the why, that's all we're doing tonight is asking why. Why did you respond that way? Because you consumed that your dad was angry, so you produced anger. After all, you've seen and heard dad respond that same way hundreds of times. In fact, you learned some of the words you wanted to say from what your dad has said plenty of times. So why did you respond that way? Because when 
when you really get to the, the bottom of it, you don't even like anger. You, you actually don't even feel good whenever you are angry. Whenever you're disrespected at school and the teacher calls you out and you feel embarrassed and then you give disrespect back to them to try to get some of the respect back, you don't like being disrespected. Why would you produce disrespect? And then you start hearing murmurings around the hall. Oh, they got anger issues. Yeah, they went off on our teacher. Yeah, you don't mess with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you think it's respect. But to be honest with you, you're, you don't even like that feeling. So what if, what if you did this little exercise, okay? So imagine that dad begins his lecture, all right? So you have a good 15 minutes before he's going to pause and take a breath. So you have time to think, okay? So in that moment, keep nodding your head during all this, okay? But during that moment, what if you changed your question from why is dad so angry about my room not being clean? What if you changed the word angry to passionate? The reason I say that is because passionate, like anger, is a strong emotion. But the difference is you produce what you consume, right? So if you use the word angry, it produces anger in you, and now you want to meet aggression with aggression. But when you change the word to passionate, it actually makes you more compassionate toward the subject you're discussing. So what if you said, why is dad so passionate about my room not being clean? Not really, he doesn't come up here a lot, but when he mentioned, when he comes up here, it's like dirty all the time. And to be honest, like if I'm going to be honest with myself, again, nodding this whole time while dad's lecturing you, I'm actually upset because I hardly even see him because he's always working. So he's always working, but when he does see me and see my room, it's a mess. I wonder if it's possible that, well, I never thought about that before, that it appears that I'm ungrateful for this space and everything they've gotten me because it's thrown all on the floor and they just bought me that this past Christmas and I really wanted those pants and now they're on the floor and he's working hard to make all this happen and it appears that my behavior is ungrateful. I never thought of it that way. And now all of a sudden, you just took your perspective and opened it up. From a different view. What you did was you changed your heart position. The parable that Jesus gave about those four responses, it boils down to a heart condition. Not palpitations, okay, not no CPR needed, but a heart condition that you're conditioned because of what you've consumed to respond the way you respond. And it's, it's so crazy that we can meet anger with anger when we don't even like anger. My favorite's when people disrespect someone because they feel disrespected, but they have a phrase. Okay, you've heard this. Help me finish it if you know it. To give respect, or to get respect, you have to give respect. So that's why I went off on my teacher, Josh. That's awesome. I just want to let you know that you actually use that phrase inappropriately because you went off on them because you wanted the respect. That's right. And you didn't get the respect. That's right but you wanted the respect. Yes, that's right. So why did you not give the respect? Because I didn't get respect from them. We're not talking about them. We're, that's you talking about what you're consuming, but we're talking about what you're producing. What if you started producing what you wanted to see and consume from other people? What do you mean, Josh? Well, I mean this. What if, what if you got some new shoes and you wish that someone would talk about your new shoes? Here's all you have to do. Say, oh, man, wow, I really like your shoes. Why don't you be what you want to see? Why don't you produce what you want to consume from other people around you? Why don't you start it? Why don't you be a trendsetter instead of just a follower? What if you wanted someone to sit with you at lunch and talk to you and ask you how your day was and how you're really doing? Well, then you should probably go sit with someone at lunch and ask them, how are you really doing? Why don't you produce what you want to consume? So with that, it's taking all of your experiences that you've had, that you've been closed off from, and adding a perspective, opening your heart. But here's why that's really cool. So check this out. Um, Jesus was once asked this question. Jesus, rabbi, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? There's like 600 of them. There's 600 rules we have to follow. 
to you which one has the top priority. And Jesus, because he's a savage, gave two answers because he rolls like that. And the answers you actually know. If you're new to squad and you have a gray bracelet from squad, it's on your wrist. It's like the mantra of squad. It's to love God and love people. It's Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 39. So he's asked, what's the greatest? And here's Jesus' response, verse 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Josh, what are you saying? Love God with all of you, with everything you've got, with what matters most to you. And it, it's hard to do it when you're closed off. But when you're open up to him with your heart, with your soul, and with your mind. And when you do that, you are filled, which is our serious title. But Jesus went on and he said, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. See, there's the problem. For many of us, we don't love ourselves the way we should because we don't see ourselves the way we should. What if you saw yourself the way God sees you? I bet your perspective would change. I bet your heart would change. I bet your outlook would change, and I bet how you treat other people would change. Here's why. Because you produce what you consume. And if all you perceive and consume from other people is, I don't matter to them, I don't matter, no one cares for me, then the way you're going to treat other people is, I'm not going to care for them either. You're going to produce what you consume. So what if you were different? What if tonight you decided, you know what, I'm going to open up my heart. I'm going to ask God to come into my heart. I want to be filled with love for God and for people, and I want him to come and change my perspective. So what's really cool about that is that this water representing you filled when you love God and love people the Bible calls that being spirit filled that God's working in you to I don't feel like respecting my mom when she's arguing with me but because of who she is my mom and Jesus said honor your father and mother then I'm going to give her honor I'm gonna say yes ma'am yes ma'am even though I don't feel like it that when you're feeling disrespected by a teacher, I'm not going to go off and clap back on this teacher. I'm going to say, hey, they're a teacher of authority. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to have respect for them. Why? Not because necessarily you think they deserve it, but because of who God is in you. Why? Because your spirit feels. Well, Josh, I don't understand that you just said that we can only produce what we consume. So now you're asking me to produce something that maybe I'm not always consuming. Maybe there's a negative tone at home or a lot of anger at home or around my friends, and you want me to produce something else? How am I supposed to do that? By being spirit-filled and not just convenience-filled. You see, there's this thing that happens when you're spirit-filled, and, and it, uh, it tells you what will be produced in you. And it's actually found, and you know this, you have access to it in the Bible, Galatians chapter 5. And it's called the fruit of the Spirit. And in this parable, Jesus talked about being fruitful and producing. So we're going to call it in our next series, the produce section. That's right. So next time you're in food line, I want it to be different. You're walking past here, it's the, the bananas and the lettuce, the produce section. We're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, because when you start behaving and honoring God, things shift, and you start responding different even when you don't necessarily feel like it. Not because you're like, oh, the Holy Spirit's on me. Not, like, it's not weird. It's just that you purposefully and intentionally want to honor God, even when people around you don't seem to be purposefully or intentionally honoring God or you. So we're going to call that being uh, the produce sections, our next series. I hope you can come back and join us for that. But it's all about being spirit-filled. So my last question to you, squad, and then we're going to close, is this. What are you filled with? If it's anger, if it's resentment, if it's uh, hate, if it's joy, if it's happiness, if it's lust, 
then my question to you is, why? Why is that your response? And just consider how you are producing into others what you're consuming. So if you want to produce something different, maybe consume something different. And to begin consuming something different, we want to see you next week. And we'll help you with that. Let me pray for you. Hey, thank you so much for watching this message at Cross Point Church and our youth group. If you want to receive Christ as your personal Savior, we're so excited for you making that decision. But perhaps you want to know more about what that means and, of course, what's next. So please go to the description, check out those links to find out more information. And, of course, reach out and we can schedule your baptism whenever you're ready. But thank you again for watching. Have a great rest of your week and we love you guys.